we're really fixing to see a lot of things happening. I know we, we've been through a lot of, of ancient history, if you will. Uh, we're, we're getting into stuff that's not quite, you know, no, Miss Katie, I wasn't there. <laughs> All right. Uh, we're, we're, <laughs> she snickered. So we're, we're, we're going to start getting into some, some more uh, things that you'll, you'll recognize a lot more. Today we'll, we'll, we'll deal with. Uh, a split that, that you'll, you'll recognize the name and some of you'll be a little familiar with the history. Uh, so we were, kind of, we were waiting to get everything together. So that's, uh, I hope you, you, I appreciate the fact that you, you've stuck with it this long. And I hope that as we go forward from here, it just really begins to open up uh, to where, where you'll be able to see how all of this is starting to fit together, okay? Uh, and you need to hang on because the farther we get, the more, <laughs> the more confusing it's going to get because there's just going to be more players in the game. Uh, and, and really, in the last 100, 200 years, things have really just exploded uh, as far as religion is concerned. Uh, and then, as we've noticed here recently, the huge push that's beginning to happen now, while everything has fractured so much, now there's this large push to try to break it all back together and put all these pieces back together. And we understand from reading biblical prophecy uh, that the, the point of all of that is to bring back the, uh, or bring us to a one world government, a one world religion. Uh, and we, we, we're already seeing the beginnings of that. Uh, and, and really, they, they have used COVID-19 in a major, major way to try to push for a lot of that. All right. All right, so we're going to go ahead and pick up. We're going to go back to uh, the, the idea of, of uh, the Bible and me or putting the puzzle together uh, as we've looked through the Scriptures. Now, we don't have a whole lot of time to go through and do a lot of reviews, so we're going to just jump in really, really quickly. Uh, we have broken down history uh, into several different bite-sized pieces, if you will. Uh, we, we looked at the church. We talked about the established church, and that was just when Christ started his church and, and got things rolling there. And then we talked about the primitive church and that dealt with just those in for, uh, 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 what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, uh, beginning building blocks at foundational, you know, the Christ established the church and then you begin to see it uh, being set up by Christ and, and, and things coming together. Uh, then we talked about the people's church and we, we got to the point to where uh, you just began to see uh, uh, the division that took place. Uh, and as this division happened and as things began to scatter, uh, you, you began to see folks that would stay true to the scriptures to, to rise up. And we've talked about all of these names, the different individuals, and that's why uh, I called it the People's Church. And then uh, we're, we're getting almost to the place, 1600, where you'll start seeing what I'm going to call the organized church. Uh, and, and, and you understand I'm, I'm using that word church in this sense very broad. Uh, but just to kind of give us an understanding of how we've gone through. The Bible very clearly breaks down these, uh, the, this church age in the different periods in the Revelation. It's very careful about that. We've talked about the apostolic age. Uh, was that there in the very beginning up to about 100 AD uh, where Christ was starting his church and, uh, and, and the teaching that was going on there and all those things that were happening. Then we talked about the persecuted church, about 100 to 300, and, and that's where we saw the beginning, really, of the struggle, and, and, and the old devil began to persecute and try to drive the church out of existence, and, and, and really, the more he persecuted, the more the church, a lot of the church just came together, uh, and which usually is the result of persecution, but, uh, but there were some that scattered and some things began to happen uh, in, in the church. We talked about that. Then we talked about the indulged church, and that went all the way almost to uh, 600 A.D., and, and we saw some very major events there, and the major events that we saw in that struggle of religion. Uh, you began to see the two very broad main streams of what we're going to say is religion, and one is Christianity, or following Christ, uh, and then the other, we're gonna, we understood, became Catholicism, uh, and it just became a universal religion trying to unite more of a kingdom uh, than it was to bring people to Christ. All right? They lost their focus there. Uh, and then we talked about, to, to, uh, and we're in 
or we were finishing up the pagan uh, age or the pagan period of the church. And this is just where you see all of these different problems begin to come up. And, uh, and from 600 to 1500, you saw most of your, your things that we see as, as, uh, as heresy uh, in religion begin to, to really become established. Uh, we're talking about the worship of Mary. We're talking about the worship of saints. And we're talking about infant baptism. And we're talking about uh, baptismal regeneration. And while it had its start way back, we talked about that earlier, just in this time period, it really became entrenched in religion. All right? So we call that the pagan church period. And it just, it can, just continued to get worse and worse and worse. All right? And then we get into the, the, what we call the dead church. And this is just where things just go, go haywire. Uh, there's something that, that happens in this time. This is where we are and what we'll talk about today. But there's something that happens here uh, that, is, it, that is interesting uh, historically-wise. Uh, there's this thing that's called the Reformation. Right? You'll hear that word used a lot. You'll, you, and you got to understand, we don't have time to get into all that yet, but... Uh, you'll hear, even today, you'll hear a lot of talk about Reformed theology. Now, for some people, that's a whole different thing. And again, we'll get to that as we, as we begin to study. But when we find this big Reformation. There, there are three major denominations, uh, I'm going to be careful when I say that, that came out of this idea of Reformation. But let me just ask you this question before we, before we get into it. What does, what does that word reformation mean? When, when we look at the idea of reforming, we need to understand what's going on. We're going to see that today. We're going to find in these three major, and three others than Catholicism, we're going to find that each founder, or, or the, 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 the fathers of these movements, they were true reformers, and originally, they had no intent. They had no intent of starting another denomination. Their intent was to reform the Catholic Church. They wanted to, to take that church and, and take it back to where it, it, it would be biblical again. That was their, and we'll see that today. But like most large institutions, I'll be careful when I say this, and I think you'll know where I'm going with this. Like most large institutions, once they start down the liberal path, it is very, very difficult to ever bring them back to where they needed to be. That's why as a church it is so very important that we watch and we pray and we stay with the Word of God. Because once you start down a path, once you, once you, once you open Pandora's box, if you will, it is very, very difficult to get that thing closed. All right, and we're going to see some of that as we go through. All right, we've gone through. We're not going to go back all, over all of these names, but we just want to look at the two major divisions that have developed. Remember there at the top, you see the line of Christians. Uh, and we've talked about all of these different groups, these people groups. that We've talked about their doctrine. We've talked about what they believed. We've, we've talked about the historical record of those, of those peoples. And, and we saw the definite distinction uh, between uh, the, the group that came out of that, which we understand became Catholicism. Right? That's the red line there. And then last week we talked about the split there. Or, or two weeks ago we talked about that, uh, that there was a, a regional split. There was an east and west problem between Catholicism. We came up with uh, the, the east and west, uh, the, the Greek Orthodox and the Roman Catholic. That's where that came from. Uh, and that had to do with more of a, a regional problem uh, uh, that split there. All right. And then last week we talked about the Waldenses and we dealt with that, those peoples in the valley of the, uh, of the Piedmonts and, and how all that happened. All right. If any of that's confusing to you, go back, please, go back and watch the videos we've done before. All right. We just don't have time. I've spent 10, 15 minutes already just trying to give a quick review. All right. Uh, so go back and watch those. You can pick them up on Facebook or YouTube uh, and it'll help you understand. So today we're going to move forward. All right. We're going to get into the 1500s. And we're going to start in 1530, officially, uh, there is a, a, another group uh, that, that, that starts, right? Uh, this group comes out of the Catholic Church. It's called the Lutheran Church. Uh, how many of you know who, who started that one? Amen. 
fell about that one, Martin <laughs> Luther. Uh, and, and so that's what we're going to be talking about today. And again, we're talking about the Reformation period. There are a lot of folks, and I just hang on to this, there are a lot of folks that will say, well, Baptists came out, they're a product of this Reformation period. I, again, I want to remind you in our studies so far, we have seen that there the, the, the distinction and the differences between our forefathers, who will become known as Baptists, and the others. So there was no Reformation or no, <laughs> I'm trying not to use a word on purpose till we get there. Uh, for the Baptist. We have been trying to hold to the word of God from the beginning. Uh, are, are, are Baptists perfect? No. Uh, do, do, do Baptist groups have difficulties? Of course. Uh, but, but we want to try to hold to the, the scriptures. All right. So uh, we'll jump in. We'll start looking. So today we're going to talk about uh, the Lutheran church. The Lutheran church. All right. Uh, it was started by a fellow by the name of Martin Luther. Uh, that's actually uh, an artist rendition of, of, of Mr. Luther uh, from uh, way back there in the 1500s. All right. yeah, I think he was born in 1486, I think, if I remember correctly. Uh, maybe, I may have been here. I don't remember. Uh, so as we start getting there, it's 1483. He was born in 1483 in Germany. Uh, so this really has uh, uh, the foundations of the Lutheran church are, are in uh, the, the Germanic people. Uh, that's where he was raised and he grew up. Some things interesting about Martin Luther that we need to know. Uh, in 1505, he entered St. Augustine's Monastery. Uh, 1505, uh, Martin Luther, he was a very brilliant man from, from all, all the things that you will read. Uh, he started out, he was not going to become a monk. Uh, he was not going to be a priest. Uh, he started out, he was going to be a secular uh, uh, philosopher. Uh, and he began to study and began to do all of these things. And, uh, and through the influence of his family, in 1505, he, he joined St. Augustine's Monastery. All right? uh, and then in 1517, or and then in 1507, I didn't put this on here for the history. In 1507, he was actually ordained as a priest. 1507, so by the Catholic Church, Martin Luther was ordained as a priest in 1507. By 1517, Martin Luther had realized that there were some difficulties. Here's the thing, if you'll study the history of Martin Luther, it's an interesting thing. He got to reading the Bible. <laughs> he, he, what he wanted to do is he wanted the Bible in the German language for his people. So he began to translate the German. Now, he was using the Latin Vulgate. And we've already determined that that was a corrupt text. But there's enough truth in that corrupt text for him to go, wait a minute, something is not right here. So in 1517, Martin Luther posts his 95 thesis. He nails that thesis to the church door in 1517, which was not an uncommon practice. Okay? This, this, was, this was their way of saying, I am available for debate. If you would like to debate these topics, here they are. Let's talk about it. Now basically, that's what he said. He, he's saying, I, I want to discuss these, and he had 95. I want to discuss these things about the church that need to be reformed. That, that need, there, there's questions that I have from Scripture about these things. Now, you can really break them down into two major things, and we'll do that here in a moment in the problems that they have. All right, so in, in 1517, he posted, you know, even now they're starting, now, now there are some historians today. I was reading after some folks this week that are starting to even cast doubt on whether he even posted these on the church door. I mean, they're even starting to say, well, all the histories that you've learned may not even be true. It's interesting how, how folks are trying to change history to meet their, 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 their uh, philosophy or their mindset. We need to be careful. Yep. All right, I'm not going to chase that rabbit <laughs> for obvious reasons. All right? So here's now let's, let's give you the place. We're just kind of giving you the background. We're going to get there in just a minute, okay? 
Uh, remember, that's where we talked about where the Waldensians were. They were there in the, the Battle of Piedmont, there, France, uh, that area, Switzerland, the, the, the rugged mountains in that area. That's where they were. All right. So Martin Luther starts there in Germany. Uh, that's where I, we could go through the town and all that stuff, but most of us wouldn't know where that was. Uh, I'm, I'm doing good to know where Germany is in public school. Thank you. All right. <laughs> uh, but as, as, as Lutheranism, uh, as it was originally called, began to spread, it went into Norway and Sweden, it went into Iceland, uh, it went into uh, Finland, uh, then you had it in Denmark and Latvia and, ba and Estonia, and those, uh, really that kind of that northern area of Europe, that's, that's really where uh, the ideas of Luther really began to take hold. Right, so, so you see it began to spread quite a bit. And, and, and the importance of that is this, the more it spread, the more the church, okay, I'm going to back up and say it a different way, the more Catholicism were forced to acknowledge what was going on. They had to do something about it. The more it grew, they, they had to address it, right, and address it they did, all right. So the purpose, what was, what was Luther's problem? What was his purpose? Why did he say we need to do something? All right, you can break it down to two things. All right, here they are. Number one, it's what they call the principle problem. Uh, and it dealt with the authority of the scripture. Uh, if Luther would have just crossed that line a little bit further, he probably would have made a good balance. If he had just carried out his thought a little bit further than he did. If he would have gave up the idea of reforming and just said, Fooey on that. I just want to be, can I say fooey on that in church? I, I want to just, I'm just going to be right to the scriptures and I just want to go and, and do the right thing and, and forget about Catholicism. He might have been converted. All right, don't go wrong with that. Okay. Now, here in his writings, here's what he said. Number one, there's only, only one divinely inspired book. You, you begin to see he's starting to break tradition with Catholicism. Right? He said this, it's the only source of divinely revealed knowledge. Well, now we've got that number two. It's getting a little more specific. Now you're starting to notice why uh, the bishops and, and, and the, the hierarchy of the Catholic Church begin to take notice of him because he's starting to say some things that contradict what they've taught all of these years. We're in the 1500s. The Bible was the only normal book or the only norm for Christian living. The Bible. We're going to do what the Bible says and that's it. Well, that flew well in the face of a lot of the Catholic teaching at the time. That's why he nailed it to the door. We need to discuss these problems. The second thing, and all of this came out of Lutheranism off of Wikipedia. If you want to look that up, you can read some of that. Uh, the second thing was called the material problem, and it dealt with the doctrine of justification. Now, I'm going to show you something. These are the writings of Luther himself made these comments. Here's what he believed. You ready? He believed that justification was by grace alone, through faith alone, on the basis of Scripture alone. Wait a minute, some of you just made the break, he'd have been a good Baptist. <laughs> but he was not, he was a reformer, not a replacer. And there's a big difference. He just wanted to fix what was there, and sometimes, listen, sometimes in the medical community, sometimes you cannot fix, you just have to remove. problem compounds, and let me just show you the response, and then we're going to get to the teachings. We'll, we'll get there in just a moment, okay? Uh, we'll get to the response. Uh, here's what happened. They were the first group that were called Protestants. You hear that word a lot? That's where it came from. They were deemed, it was not a term of endearment. The Catholic Church dubbed them Protestants because they were protesting the Mother Church. Right? Now, Martin Luther hated that name. Here's what, here's what Martin Luther called their movement himself. He called them evangelicals. That'll ring a few 
bells for today. There are a lot of folks today that call themselves evangelicals today. Some of it has their roots here, and, and now you've got into what's called the new evangelicals, and, and it just, we'll get to all that. Right? And again, we've talked about this already. He sought to correct or reform, but not replace, and that was his problem. Right? And the Edict of Worms, now Worms, that was a place, that was a seat. Right? <laughs> the Edict of Worms, in 1521, the Catholic Church came out again. They had to do something. 1517, he posted his thesis. So this is what, four years later? Yeah. Uh, I said public school. Okay. Uh, four years later, uh, he, th this came out. Number one, what they do? The Catholic Church condemned Luther as an heretic. They didn't like what he was saying. So therefore, they just said, oh, you're a heretic, you're condemned. Uh, they did a lot of things to him, but we'll, 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 we'll chase that rabbit a whole lot. They banned the defense and the propagation of his teachings or ideas. They said this, if, you, if we find out that you believe like he does, or if we hear that you're teaching those things that he taught, you're in trouble. And one of the things that they did, I mean, they did a lot of ugly things, but one of the things that they did uh, is they would literally seize your property. They would take everything that you had. The Catholic Church would do that. You ever been to some of these Catholic churches in other countries? You, you ever look at some of the pictures of, the, of these churches in other countries? They are, they are immaculate. I mean, they are, they are marble and gold. And, and just, where did all that money come from? Now, where this came from, I'm going to show you this, and, and we'll just kind of start talking about these seven. And again, we've picked these seven so we can be consistent across the board talking about all of these. We've explained where we as Baptists stand on these seven cardinal or principal doctrines. Is this everything that we believe? No, it's just seven that we can use as a benchmark. All right? What I did is I got on the, the, the website of St. Paul's Lutheran Church in Paducah, Kentucky. A local Lutheran congregation. I looked up, so a lot of this information will come from their website and from the links that are provided on that website to other organizations like the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod. We'll explain that in a minute. And then also that, that, that's the lcms.org. That's the website for the Lutheran Church. The, and even the Lutheran Church, they couldn't get along either. So they split again. And then, you know, you got all that kind of stuff. You know, hey, don't, 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 don't think too bad about them. There are 36 different Baptist groups. Exactly. <laughs> all right. Before we start looking down our nose at them, maybe. Right. So let's talk about biblical authority. We've talked about what Luther believed. But as we come forward today, what is being promoted? What does the Lutheran church, where do they stand according to Scripture? All right? Interesting thing here. I know it's a lot of reading. I'll read it to you quickly. It says that in 2008, the U.S. Religious Landscape Survey conducted by the Pew Research Center surveyed almost 2,000 adults in the United States that self-identified as Lutherans. So you got that. They self-identified as Lutherans, almost 2,000 of them. The study found that 30% believed that the Bible was the Word of God and was to be taken literally word for word, 30%. 40% held that the Bible was the Word of God but was not literally true word for word or were unsure if it was literally true word for word, 40%. 23% said the Bible was written by men and not the Word of God. And 7% did not know, were not sure, or had, no other, or had another position. Now, we look at that, we shake our head, we go, oh my, that's terrible. I, I would hate to see, I don't have the statistics, but I, I'd hate to see what that was for that. <coughs> Probably, I, I really would. I would hate to see that. I mean, I know, what, I know where we stand. It's Calvary Baptist Church, but... Whew. And we'll probably eventually get there, all right? Uh, so the ELCA, uh, that's the Evangelical Lutheran Church of America. 
That's one group. And we talked about the Lutheran Church and Missouri Synod. That's the other group. There's two major groups in America. That's the two, that, that's, two, that's one of them. All right? Here's what they believe. They believe the, the Evangelical Lutheran Church of America believes that the Bible contains the Word of God. That in there somewhere, the Word of God's in, in there somewhere, you just got to find it. Well, that opens up a whole lot of problems. Who gets to say which part is and which part isn't? Right. Well, you know, if I like it, then it is. But if I don't like it, it's not. <laughs> it's all subjective. All right? And, and then the other side of it, this is the more liberal aspect of the Lutheran Church. And then the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod, uh, they believe the Bible is the Word of God. But we're going to find out that as we dig through all of this, do they actually practice what it says? All right. So here's what we're going to do with the Bible. I'm, I'm going to give a big X there. Uh, because, you know, that if they don't believe the Word of God is true, if they don't live it, they really don't believe in biblical authority. All right? We're going to move on. What about the autonomy of the local church? Well, it's very simple. We can deal with this one. In Lutheran traditions, a synod uh, can be a legislative body at various levels of the church administration. It also refers to an administrative region or an entire church body. When you talk about the, the Lutheran church, the Missouri Synod, that's just not a Missouri group of churches. Uh, that is a national organization uh, that has a hierarchy uh, that is very similar to Catholicism with a president or a head and archbishops and bishops and, uh, and, and dioceses in, in different locations. And, and, and one of the things that I read this week you know, talked about them uh, assisting. That's the word they used assisting the local churches in finding a pastor. That's a nice way to put that. If they get to inform you, they, they get to uh, help you uh, get the pastor they need you to have, they want you to have. All right. Uh, so uh, in, in, in autonomy of the local church, I, I'm going to also give them a big X right there uh, because they're, they're not, their churches are not making decisions for themselves. They have to agree with what the synod says. They have to agree with what the groups of, of leaders say. Uh, and you have to follow their, their rule and their law. I, I'm, glad, I'm glad I'm just a, I'm going to say it. I'm going to say it today. I'm, not, I'm glad I'm just a guy with the Bible. <laughs> let's, let's just stay with the book. All right. <clears throat> the priesthood of the believer. Uh, as we go forward, we dig a little deeper about what they believe. Uh, we'll find this. Lutherans typically, now, now here, there's some differences. They broke from Catholicism with some things, but they, they don't do confession like, like Catholics do. They don't have the, most of them don't have the confessional. They don't have the priest going in there and, and you go and sit and speak and talk to them uh, weekly. They don't really do that. And usually they only do this twice a year. But twice a year, Lutherans typically will kneel at the communion rail to confess their sins. While they, now, I, I mean, you want to come to the altar and confess your sins. That's between you and God. I'm okay with that. But keep reading. While the confessor listens and then offers absolution while laying their stole, which is part of their robe, on the penitent's head. Therefore, signifying passing absolution or forgiveness to the individual. I'm glad I don't need a man to listen to me confess. Right. I'm glad I don't have to go to an individual and ask for them to tell me what I need to do to get forgiveness of my sin. Just a man with a Bible. I'm glad there's one mediator between God and man. The man Jesus Christ. Amen. Or the man Christ Jesus. And I'm glad I can go to him I know the Bible talks about confessing our faults one group to another. And I understand that there is, there is safety in counsel. I get that. And I thank God for the counsel that I get here at our church from our men, from our deacons, from our finance committee, from, from different ones. And just helping and, and giving input and, and getting counsel. I'm glad when it comes to my relationship with my Heavenly Father. Through the blood of Jesus Christ, I have boldness to enter into the very throne room of God. And I don't need a man to help me get there. Uh, I'm going to give a big X right there on that one. 
Now, you may disagree with my, my conclusions on some of these. That's okay. I'm the one that put it together, so I'm just going to do my, my thing. All right? Uh, what about two ordinances? Now, this one will get fun. Two ordinances of, of, of the church. Now, remember, they, they were reformers. Right? They, they, they weren't replacers. They were just reformers. So let's talk about it. Remember we talked about a while ago when we said that, that Luther believed that, that justification was by grace alone, through faith alone, According to the scripture alone, right? Somewhere they lost that, somewhere. Baptism, this is right out of their right, out, right, out, right off of their website. The the of course the, the church in Paducah is with the Missouri Synod group of churches, so that's where this is from. Baptism is a means of grace through which God creates and strengthens saving faith. As the washing of regeneration in which infants and adults are reborn. That's baptismal regeneration. That's trusting in your baptism for your salvation. That's not trusting Christ. Somewhere along the way, by grace alone, through faith alone, and scripture alone, didn't translate. Because they're not trusting scripture alone. They're trusting their baptism. Mm -hmm. All right. Number two. I use their word, the Eucharist. We would use communion or the Lord's Supper. But I use their word on purpose. The Eucharist, here's their definition. The true body and blood of Christ are truly present in, with, and under the forms of the consecrated bread and wine. For all who eat and drink it. Now they don't believe in transubstantiation. They don't believe that it actually becomes the body and blood of Christ like Catholics do. What they believe has been, and Luther hated this according to the writings of the reading, the reading that I did this week. He hated this term. Uh, but they, it's been called consubstantiation where it's not, it doesn't transform and become the body and blood. But it contains. It's present. So they still do believe that that body and that blood of Christ is present in communion. Again, not true to scriptural teaching. All right? And then they have a third one. <laughs> well, we said two ordinances. Well, you think we you know where we're going with this one, right? Their third ordinance that they have is confession. See, we talked about already their break from Catholicism, but they could not get away from all of it. They kept some of the traditions. Confession, kneeling at the communion rails, we talked about that already, confess their sins while the confession listens and offers absolution while laying their soul and face up the penitent's head. Uh, again, that, that was, the, and they consider that an ordinance of the church. And, and an ordinance is something that you normally are required or felt like it is Encouraged to do. When we got this idea of two ordinances, I don't give another edge because they got three. They can't count. That's two, not three. And then they believe in baptismal regeneration, so we're, 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 that's, a, that's another one. The next two, there was not a whole lot that specifically, now we've mentioned one already, so I'll correct a, a little bit. Uh, I just didn't want to repeat it again. Uh, and what we're looking at. But the next one talking about individual soul liberty. I put a big question mark here because you just didn't find a whole lot of writing about it. The only thing that I did find was a statement that we read a while ago about baptism where it talked about baptism being for the infant and the adult. Individual soul liberty means you personally have to believe and trust and take the scriptures and learn we don't baptize infants. Why? Because they cannot accept the truth. They, they don't know the difference of right and wrong. They've not come to a place where they realize they're a sinner before a holy God. And they need forgiveness and they need to trust Christ. That, that's, that's all wrapped up in this idea of individual soul liberty. I am responsible for me. Now, I couldn't find, again, a whole lot of writing about that. But when they talked about infant baptism, to me, that's a... To me, that's a big X right there. <laughs> All right? And the same thing with separation under Christ. 
what you don't find in a lot of writings uh, of, of most of your your um, contemporary I hate to use that word. What's, what's a better word for modern? That's a better word. Uh, modern denominations is you're not going to find a whole lot about this idea of separation of the cross. Because what's happened in our society over the last few years, one of the most popular bumper stickers out there that you watch for it uh, is that one that says coexist. Uh, have you ever seen that? It says coexist, and it has, I don't know how many letters of that, co I count all those. But each one of those letters is a different symbol from a different religion. We've gone so far. Listen, it's kind of hard to talk about this way, get a little political. I, I'm just going to say I'm going to use this illustration. Ladies, just pardon me right here, okay? Uh, you know, they're, they're starting this big fight again about the Washington Redskins. And they've been fighting that name for 30 some odd years. They wanted to change the name. Because they, some, somebody along the way decided it offended them. We, we've gotten so sensitive. That's a polite word. You know, I, there is no way that we're going to read this book without something bothering us. <laughs> there are too many thou shalt and thou shalt nots in this book. I, I am not out to in, intentionally offend anybody. I, that's not my goal. But we still need to just preach the Bible. If Washington Redskins bother you, don't go to the game. <laughs> I mean, I could talk about a lot of stuff that bothers me that I've chosen not to participate in. We were, I'm not going to call names. I'll be nice. This morning, we were talking about a certain a, a situation. That if you were to go into some place that, that, and, and you were concealed carrying a firearm, and, which is legal in our state, you can do that. But if I went into a restaurant, say, and, and that restaurant, they realized, they noticed, somehow it showed under my shirt, or they figured out I had a firearm, you know, that, that establishment can't come and ask me to leave. It's legal for me to carry that, but it's a, it's a private place. They can say you need to leave, and I would leave. But I guarantee you, I'd let everybody know I'm never going back to that place because that's my choice. I don't have to go there. That's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. I'm not offended by that. I'm just saying, that's my choice. I'm not going back. We've got to understand, in a world today, in a world today where everybody says, just let people do their own thing. I'm just going to ask you, I'm preaching now. I'm just going to ask you a question. And I want you to think about it, and we'll do the last one we're finished. The last, let's see, I'm 53 years old, so that's probably the last 30 years. It seems like the direction that the church, I'm going to be very general with that, with that statement. It seems like over the last 30 years, the general direction of the church has been... Let's let let let's let's let everybody do their thing. Let's not let's not hold anybody to a standard. Let's not say there's right and wrong. How has that worked? Now I'm just I'm just asking you a question. Is the church better off today because we've done that? Is the church more spiritual today because we've said well? Standards aren't really important. Now you can take that word standard and you can apply it however you want to. I'm just saying separation under Christ is not a major issue with most religions today. And my question is, has it helped? Has it helped? Or has it hurt? Now you be the judge. You, you look at that. You look at our society. You look at where churches are today. And, and you look at... <coughs> There may be some that are full this morning, but you look at what's going on there. You look at their life and what they do when they leave that building. Are we better off today than we were 30 years ago? 40 years ago, 50 years ago, 
Some of you out, uh, uh, predate me and you're able to talk about 60 years ago. Uh, uh, set a question. I'm gonna, I'm gonna give. A, I'm gonna give. A, I'm gonna throw a question mark on there because I just I, I can't demonstrate or show you anything, and I want to be consistent. I don't want to just you know throw mud. So we're gonna we're gonna put up a question mark there. And then finally, uh, the two officers of the church, uh, pastors and deacons, uh, we understand that we we saw that they had a number of uh, bishops and archbishops and hierarchy similar to Catholicism. So we're going to give them an X there too. Uh, that, that, that doesn't look too good. That report card, card is not real good. <laughs> but preacher, we're all going the same place. <laughs> preacher, we all believe the same thing. <laughs> preacher, we, we, we all just, you know, we just want to be right with God. I, that's my whole point. My whole point is, really? You, you, you think so? No, no, there's some definite problems. No. I get to say it again. Just a guy with a Bible. <laughs> I guess I need to give Spencer, Spencer Smith uh, royalties for that. I borrowed it from him. <laughs> well, Spencer, if you ever hear that, that's, uh, there you go. <laughs> Just a guy with a Bible. As we go forward, you think it's confusing. I understand. It's going to get worse. Yeah. Oh, yeah. But we need to know what we're dealing with. You knock on the door and somebody says, oh, yeah, I'm a Lutheran. Now you know what you're dealing with. Most of them don't know what salvation is. Most of them have never heard a clear presentation of the gospel. Oh, I'm saved. I'm going, I'm going to heaven. Really? Lord, we would just give them the gospel if they could hear truth. Father, again, we're thankful for the day. What a joy it's been just to be in your house this morning. Help us today. I pray that you'll give us grace and strength. Draw us closer to you. Father, I pray for uh, Brother Fred Jones that you'd have your hand on him. Father, that you would comfort him, that you would that just give him grace and strength. Uh, Father, I pray that you'll just be with others on our prayer list and others that, that have needs. Uh, we specifically today want to mention uh, Owen Matthews and we'll uh, I pray that you'll have your hand on them. I know he's got surgery coming up this week. And Father, I pray that you'll give that family grace. Be with us for the remainder of our services in Jesus' name. Amen.